Our first panel is Moving Up Market, How to Acquire, Close, Service, and Retain Enterprise Brands. So we're going to be bringing up uh, Code Up, Trellis, Radical, Be Part Of, and Smart Solutions. So please give a round of applause for Asim, Ross, Carol, Greg, and Lisa. Uh, my name is Asim Bawani. I'm the founder and CEO of Code Up. CodeUp is a, um, a development agency for other e-commerce development agencies that serve direct-to-consumer brands as well as manufacturers and help them do B2B e-commerce or direct-to-consumer e-commerce. Um, we're going to be doing a panel today on moving up market. Um, we have a, an amazing set of panelists here um, who will talk about the entire cycle. We'll talk about um, going from acquisition then closing these enterprise deals, and then being able to price them in a way that's profitable, and then finally being able to do a good job fulfilling on those enterprise expectations because they are very different. So we have Greg from Be Part Of, we have um, Carl from Radical, we got Lisa from Smart Solutions, and we got Ross from Trellis. I will hand over the mic to each of them to talk about talk a little bit about them and then we'll kick off the panel. All right, Lisa, you want to start? Yeah, Lisa Alexander, Lisa Alexander with Smart Solutions. I probably don't need a mic because I'm pretty loud. Um, I'm the, I function as the CRO. I work on the sales and marketing side of the house. Um, Ross Byler from Trellis, um, formerly ran an agency called GrowSpark, merged with Trellis back in 2018. I'm the COO of the company, leading all of delivery and operations. Uh, and like a couple people here, we do e-commerce as an agency. Um, we're more specifically focused on really complex, uh, funky uh, projects. So we like a big, nasty, a lot of data integration, things that uh, aren't easy to do. Those are the problems we like to solve. <clears throat> Hi, uh, I'm Carl from Radical. I'm a co-founder of the agency. We're focused on uh, Shopify and Shopify Plus builds and integrations with a little uh, different systems. And I focus a lot on the lead gen and the acquisition of new clients. Um, I'm Greg Johnston, and I'm, I'm going to say it a little bit more, I think, than these guys have, but uh, because I think it'll resonate with some people out there. Um, but. Basically, I founded uh, Be a Part of in 2004 with, um, with a salesperson on a 100% commission and a developer doing 25 hours a week, so part-time basically. Um, but really, you know, rolled up from three and lived in that five to eight space. Uh, and then we, we, uh, we built a, a product called MiniBC, which is a SaaS uh, recurring billing application for big commerce internally, so we incubated a, uh, a software. And that really helped to, to grow the, the company um, with some product-led growth uh, and getting, you know, getting things in the door. So it, um, you know, through, the, through the process of getting to you know, 18, 20 people, um, you know, and then moving from a small town you know, into a big city, Toronto, to, to get better talent. Um, that was back when you had to go to the office. So it's a little easier to get talent these days, but um, you know it really helped to to grow the company and ultimately get acquired. Uh, so I, I I now do the same thing, but inside of a, a larger company um, and run the go to market for the agency you know sort of uh, be a part of and uh, run global services across the board for the company. Um, so that's what I do now. Perfect. So. Um I'll go to each of the panelists one by one, um, and we'll try and make it interactive. We'll leave some time for Q&A at the end. Um, now, um, of course, I think everyone here is interested in moving up market. Of course, you've got to um, increase your, you know, you've got to be, have, you have better retention. You've got to get better and better clients and be able to give them good service as well. So we'll start with Carl. Um, and uh, with Carl, so Carl basically leads uh, BizDev at Radical. And so the first question, Carl, for you is, um, like what customer acquisition strategies have moved and proven the most effective? And how are they different? Like if you're going a mid, after a mid-market brand um, and versus you're going after the enterprise, 
how are those strategies different? What works and what are some of the gotchas? Like you would expect that that would work for the enterprise, but it's the other way around. What are some of those things? Okay, so I, I think we evolved from, a, uh, we started the agency with three and now we're a lot more. So our clients also grew during the years and we see, uh, uh, oh, of course, now they're, they're bigger. Um, some things are still similar. One is they need to know that you exist, so you need to be out there. If you're not out there, they don't know you and they will not approach you. So that's something that, that keeps during all these levels the same. And another thing is um, I also like read audiobooks on acquisition and I can share later, I forgot the names of the books, but like they focus a lot on just be out there, get noticed, um, and, and be present on multiple layers. I think that's one that we now focus so much, and I, I hear from a lot of our clients or people that I know, oh, you guys are everywhere, You're, uh, especially in Belgium market. We focus on a Belgium market with our clients, and they we're all over, or we try to be all over, and I think that's, that's one thing that makes us successful, that, oh, we know you from that and that guy or that event and this ad or that you event you did. So that, that's something that we really push hard on, so we have somebody uh, solely focused on running that, be, get radical into the space and, and get us visible. Um, and another thing that we do is we, we focus on creating uh, high-end content, uh, that we then push out with a lot of ads and automations. So we really focus on a specific niche, could be fashion, could be skincare, that we know we might have some clients in that niche and we learn a lot from them or we had an event where we talked to a few and then we're gonna, maybe we do uh, a panel with them to get to know what, what's their problems, uh, what's your insight, what you're struggling with, and then that content we're gonna go uh, deep and deeply invest, could be a webinar, could be a white paper, could be both or, or more, um, that we create something that's downloadable uh, often, and then we push ads on it. And we have a, a very good ad guy, he, he pushes us to create new ads each week, uh, rewrite the CTAs um, and, and also if like the acquisition cost for ads is too high, we need to change it. He constantly helps us to improve it. And, and also we notice like some niches, the, it's like dried out or dried up and, and yeah, then we stop. But this allows us to create content, push it out and then they leave their information behind. And then we, we have other automation flows that come up and we can do reach out. But We've landed some big enterprise clients that, that came to us this way, and there was just be out there. They, they saw us, oh, I didn't know you guys exist. I saw this one, and then we got talking. And once we get talking, I think we have the, the quality in-house to, to deliver the good services, but the most important thing that we, in the beginning, struggled a lot with is, is getting out there, and that, that they know Radical exists, and that, that the services we provide can be uh, good for them. And I think in the content, we try to focus on the problems that they have, like an e-commerce manager or a CIO, he might be looking at uh, cost of ownership or uh, an e-commerce manager problem, flexibility a platform that's not uh, made for them. So, and then uh, that's how we um, create high valuable content. Very interesting. So one question I have about what you just said is, so you, you said you're, you focus on being all over, but is there some data that you're looking at or how do you, like, yes, it's being all over, but I'm sure there's a little bit more method to how you target where you want to be, where you want to be seen, whether on digital platforms or physical events like this. How do you decide where you want to be seen to reach the enterprise market? Yeah, that's a good, good point. <clears throat> now, one thing I learned is that everybody is on Meta or other platforms like that, so it's not that complicated to find people because everybody uses their phone today. Um, of course, we create segmented audiences based on yeah, information we have, but I think we can go start a bit broader and then narrow it down to more, but it's not like we're gonna go very niche on the targeting, we're gonna go very niche on the content and then we're gonna push it quite big, and then we see based on interaction, we move on and maybe be a bit more aggressive. But um, yeah, our content, uh, the, the audience to start is, shouldn't be too narrow maybe, because then yeah, you might miss uh, a bit like 
audience. There's, a, there's also a, something to be taught about what kind of content do, we want, do you want to put out there because how do you decide what is the right type of content to get the specific type of customer you're after? Because in my experience a little bit, if you're not putting out the right type of content, it, if it doesn't say the right things, you will perhaps generate leads or demand, but that might not be the kind of demand you want to generate. And so do you have um, a method, do you have a strategy around how you decide what content to put out and what format it's going to be in? Yeah. It we try a few things, and that's also called trial and error. Not everything you create is a success, uh, for us at least. Um, I think there we, we, it's also like learning from your clients, uh, talk to people, and, and just understand their struggles. And then we can <clears throat> create some content, like could be a one-pager, could be a video, could be a webinar, or we invite a guest or something. Um, that's... Uh, I think the, the call to action of the, the, the way that you approach them is more important. Uh, and uh, that's just conversion-wise uh, optimization. Um, yeah, that's how we, we, we do it. So you mentioned trial and error. And I, I think I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you. So of course, everyone's doing trial and error. But everyone thinks their success rate is shit. I think everyone's success rate is shit. Just everyone just <laughs> doesn't want to talk about it. So. Would you mind telling us, so when you do trial and error with content, how many times do you have an experiment that passes versus fails? Uh, you mean like what's, what's the ratio or a percentage or something like that? I think it's very hard. I, how I look at it is it's not percentage. I, what's the money that we invest and what's the outcome? I think that's the way that we look at it because we, we've run ads on some things that really had zero outcome or zero quality leads. And we had some performing really well that we got like two enterprise clients from one campaign. So it's really like some campaigns are completely shit and you don't get anything out of it. And that's fine. It's learning that we don't I guess do my question is how many times do you have to fail in order to get a good one? Uh, I would say if you run five campaigns, I think one can be good. That's, that's good. Because, because and, and ours is worse, by the way. But... But, you know, I think everyone who's, who's, who's new to all this, is they're thinking, you know, I'm not doing well, but, but it takes a lot of failure and trial and error to yeah. get to a point where you're doing this predictably, right? Yeah, if I, <clears throat> a campaign is like, hey, if we create a white paper that's 90 pages, we want to push it out because we put a lot of time in it. it could be, yeah, but... It can, that's a campaign, but you can do ads on Meta, you can do LinkedIn, you can do different things or cold email outreach, which sucks, so I would not recommend, but uh, <laughs> that's for us. But, uh, and, but improving your ads, your visuals, we tried video, I tried video, I, I really didn't like my videos, um, so we canceled them as well, but sometimes it's a simple call to action or something that's like, uh, also the algorithm of Meta is pretty strong these days. Um, don't use the ad creation by Meta because that looks horrible. Um, so I think it's not because one time you fail or it's not generating leads, just, you can just change your way of um, narrative. Iterate. Yeah. yeah, iterate that before you drop it. Yep. No, I think as long as you understand what you did wrong in your previous iteration, and then you're able to fix that, and then, you know, again, fail and figure out what you did wrong again, I think that's how you, you're going to eventually get it. Um, you Lisa, have to kiss a lot of toads. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Find your yeah. Um, so, Lisa, so basically we are, we're talking, Lisa, about sales and closing. So, um, so we have, you know, we use our acquisition strategies to get, a, you know, get people top of the funnel. And then, um, you know, from there, uh, what do you think is, are, are the best ways to get the most long-term value out of your clients? Because it's not always, so when, again, when you're selling to, the, to small businesses or to mid-market, you can have a, a mindset of, you know, what's my profitability going to be, what my numbers are. But then when you're selling to the enterprise, their expectations are very different. They expect you to be a lot more flexible up front. Trust comes, you know, a little bit harder. And so what strategies do you put in place to win the client, A? Um, do you have to be a lot more flexible? Or how do you go about doing all that and then making sure you land the deal and also not just land it. Of course, you've got to grow that client 
and that account over years. Yeah, I think there's a couple things that you need to consider. Um, Long-term value. Nobody wants to give up margin. Nobody wants to have an accelerated timeline. Nobody wants to give them more scope. Um, but enterprise brands, it's there's a lot more bureaucracy and paperwork and much larger teams. So once you win them, they're going to be with you long term. They can't just easily say, oh, I'm going to just go fire these people and hire somebody new. So I think you need to take the look at the long, long game um, and compromise. Know that maybe that $100,000 win up front, maybe you're not going to make what you want to make on it. But 10 grand a month for 12 months, for four years, you're looking at half a million dollars there. So I think if you play the long game, um, you're going to win. And I also think you need to make sure from an enterprise level that you're going to ensure that you're making their life easier. You have a marketing team and an IT director and you have cross-departmental teams who really don't care about the price. They know they're going to have to pay something, but what they really want is their life to be easier. Um, so I think when you sell that and how you can help them do their job better and have less friction, I think it's a bigger win. Make, make them look, look good. good. Yeah, yes. I think that's a big one. That's good. a really big one without saying it. <laughs> you, you can't say it, but you got to do it, right? And explain to them how you are going to bring them in only when they need to be brought in, that you're going to not waste their time. I think that's a bigger sell versus the one guy who's a, a sole proprietor. You know, he, does, he only is all about the money, not really making his life easier. Yep. Because the, the, their time isn't as expensive Today, it will be at some point, but you know, right now they're, they're going to focus only on results and also you know, what, what the ROI is specifically. Um, now, one thing that I often run into is with these enterprise clients, whether we're closing them or we've already closed them and now we're servicing them, <clears throat> they're always going to have these requests, and that ties back directly into us making their life easier. And so they will lean on you to do things that you're not contractually obligated to do. And in my experience, they will do that all the time, every and day. every day, and they will absolutely roll over your processes, your strategies, things that you've put in place to make sure you're profitable, that your operations run smoothly. And so, how do you balance that? Because it's, it is a balancing act, right? How do you how do you balance that? I think you just need to make sure that you're flexible in what you do and have a process that you know can be flexible and put things in place that allow you to accelerate velocity when they need more resource um, and make sure that your team is cross-trained and you're not relying on one resource because you're going to have to ramp up when they have those demands um, and make sure that everybody can, can fulfill. Here's another thing though. And so yes, you know, we want to be flexible. We want to give them good service. We want to retain them for a long time. But then at also, there's going to be a point where you have to sort of draw the line. And, and you have to do that with sort of every client, but with enterprise, it's a little bit tricky. And so how do you sort of um, figure out where that line is? And I think it's going to be different for each client. Yeah, I think you have to put your strategic hat on more so with enterprise because you need to be the person who's guiding multiple teams and making sure that you understand the why behind what they're asking because the IT guy is going to ask you something different than the marketing person, and I think you need to look at that bigger picture um, with enterprise more so, and be the sort of the gatekeeper, sort of managing all their internal teams. Yeah, each party has a different thing they value, right? They want different things. They and, want different things. And a lot of times they'll conflict, and then you need to just make sure that you're asking the why across the, across the teams. So there's, there's another thing that comes into play, right, with, with these different departments and the, these different stakeholders. They're going to be involved in decisions during your pre-sale leading up to the close, but also they'll be involved in the different decision-making um, that happens after you've closed in the regular you know, ops. And so many times what that will mean is delays on their side for them to decide on things, but then a mad rush as soon as they say yes. So you're... You're chasing them for four months to get a yes on something, and then the moment you get a yes, it's go, 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 I need it yesterday. Right? I've never had that happen. <laughs> really? <laughs> so so how, do you, how do you manage those expectations? How do you, how do you, you know, balance that? It's, again, it's, it's, you can't just say no, but you also can't 
work with that. So you've got to find a middle ground to be able to work with them. And I think it's important for them to understand your process as well. Like, you need to talk to them about how best to communicate with you as an agency and what your process is and make sure that they understand just because your urgency, you know, or your lack of um, giving what you need is not, you know, my problem, right? So I think you just have to set expectations, you know, level set. One thing that I've sort of figured out is if it's two or three people that have to make a decision together and they just can't, they're just gonna keep the, throwing the ball at each other and that happens, I will try and just get them on a single call together. It's very hard, but if you can manage that and have that conversation with all three or two people or four people, whatever, in a single call in the room and have a very, very clear agenda as to because you've already talked to them, to each one of them individually, you know what their issues are that are preventing a yes. And if you can just speak to each one of them directly and sort of have them debate internally within themselves and you're just an observer, I think that's, that helps. Um, it's still hard to get them on a single call, but if you can manage that, that helps. Um, now, um, I'm gonna go over to, uh, to Greg. <laughs> I just wanna check if he has the mic. So Greg, <laughs> Greg uh, was telling me that Greg has a very interesting way that he prices some of his contracts. And um, again, that goes directly to profitability and the trines, lines we're trying to draw while at the same time making sure that we're you know, giving good service. Um, how do you price your contracts? Um, you mentioned that you're able to do fixed price as well as time and material, uh, which I've tried to do and failed. Uh, you know, for the most part, not in, in making the close, but being profitable in doing it. And so the close is easy. They're like, it's, oh, yeah, we love the flexibility, but okay, but you got to be profitable. And so talk to us a little bit about how you can, you know, do a time and material plus a fixed price contract within a single scope and how you can make sure you're profitable. And I think it's going to help close as well, but then the profitability is a challenge there. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, you know, there, there's going to be things that, uh, like for us, we do, you know, complicated stuff like, you know, a custom application that might, you know, need two or three third-party integrations. But we also do design and build, which is your typical stuff. So as long as you deliver, you know, a fixed price on things that you know and, and you know what you can deliver uh, time and time again, then you're, you know, you're pretty much going to be fine on your margins uh, on anything you're doing fixed fees. And generally, fixed fees is nice because you can make more money if, you're, if everything goes well. Um, so you pair that with a, um, like a, we, we call it PST, professional services time, and you know, you can consult with them and say, hey, you know, like how, much, how much time typically do we need to spend on a client like you for the things that you're asking that are vague? So when scope is vague, um, you know, they'll be understanding that we say, okay, well, you know, three, four, 500 hours typically is what we need or something, you know, and a lot of times the, cl the client will actually throw on more hours if they have the budget because they want to they be safe. And in the enterprise space, like, they work purely on... Um, you know, budget approvals. So they have to go to somebody and say, this is how much money this project is gonna cost and get, a, get it approved. Uh, so there's not really that chance to go back uh, and, and you wanna make sure that you have enough hours. So a lot of times they help, you know, upsell themselves. Uh, but it does give that, it frames that time and materials conversation where anything that isn't part of a fixed fee, uh, part of the project is going to be, um, you know, quoted out, timed, and they're gonna see it. Uh, we have a little hack that helps, um, which is that in Asana, we have a, uh, we use Zapier to um, go into EverHour, which is our time tracking software, and update the amount of hours used so that every email that goes out to that client as a task is being updated or you know whatever within the PST, um, they'll see how many hours they've burned. So there's no, they can't say, hey, like I didn't know we were out of time, um, so you still have to deliver on the things we talked about. It's very transparent. There's no way to hide how much um, time that they thought we spent on anything. Uh, and, and so it helps to make sure that they are always aware. 
and every hour spent, we're getting paid for. So, um, so again, depending on your hourly rate, you're gonna hit your margins, you're gonna be profitable on the job, and I'd say the, the even better part is that it rolls into a retainer after the fact because if they have hours that they don't use, um, you can still keep working with them, but uh, they're already in that mindset that, uh, that they need to be paying you as the time and materials after the fact. Uh, so then you can just say, how you know, based on launch, you know, we've launched, I think you probably need X hours a month to, to be maintained. And, you know, then they go for budget for that. And now you've got a, a, a contract, a retained client. Um, and, and the enterprise, you know, space certainly love that because it's just, they just want to give you stuff and you manage it and deliver and win, right? So uh, you make them look good. Talk a little bit about what you told me yesterday about you throwing in a few free hours at the start to just to build that mindset that a portion of the contract is fixed yet another portion is time and material. Yeah, so that, that was, um, I would say if you're, you know, if you're in a smaller contract or project where it's maybe just the design build, then, um, then throw in some hours, uh, f you know, free even, uh, where you can just say like, you know, these, these uh, 10 hours, and it gets that mindset uh, from the jump uh, so that, you know, those people are, are you know, thinking in a professional services time and time and materials way uh, from the beginning. Right, because one of the challenges that we faced with, with doing this specifically is, so we'll sell a, a fixed price contract, but then also have, be, have a part of it be time and material. But then because the original contract is fixed, they're in that mentality of this is a fixed price, fixed scope. Scope's never fixed, only the prices, but, um, but they're in that mentality. And so even though contractually, a part of the work is supposed to be done time and material, but even that part of the work, they're still in that mindset of, you know, you quoted, let's say, X number of hours. Oh, and if it went over, I'm only going to pay for the X hours that you initially estimated, which is not how development or, you know, or our thing works. And so how do you, how do you make sure that doesn't happen from the outset? How do you manage those expectations? What are, what's, what's this type of communication you tend to have to make sure that doesn't happen? Um, yeah, I, I think it's just, uh, you know, as transparent as possible and, and just like you said earlier, setting expectations and, um, and just making sure that uh, everything, you know, everything is what you say, you deliver and, and you know, you're not, you're not changing along the way. Uh, anything, so just, just, you know, that's what I'd say. All right, cool. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to Ross. Um, Ross, you're the COO at Trellis, and so you do a lot of work with data. Um, <coughs> you manage ops at Trellis. Um, now, one of the things that I feel is, make, is a challenge for agencies is never the capability. It's not that they cannot they don't have the capabilities in-house or the skills or the experience in-house to be able to serve the enterprise client. For me, usually, at least in my observation, it's the processes that will mean that you're unable to give the level of service that is required to serve an enterprise client. Because, again, when you're, you're working in mid-market or you're working with small businesses, they will forgive you for a lot of for not having those processes because they don't have them themselves, yeah. right? And so they don't know what a mature process looks like, but an enterprise client does, and they expect that from you. And so agencies fail not with capability, but because they don't have the processes in place or they don't have the right metrics in place or the right guardrails in place to be able to provide that service. So what are some of the things that you guys do at Trellis to make sure Sure, the capability is there, sure, but how do you make sure the team's ready, the processes are there, um, the expectation setting is being done, maybe it's documentation or maybe it's something else. What are the things you do at Trellis to make sure that sh we have the people, but these people will deliver at the level that these enterprise clients expect? Yeah, it's a great question. Lately, I've actually been trying to think a little bit less about delivery processes and more about client experience. And so instead of saying, okay, we have to create end deliverable by this date with these resources, try to take a step back and say, what is going to happen the moment a client first interacts with us all the way through us delivering that final product? And think about how do we make sure the teams that are involved in those various stages, so 
sales, your discovery team, your delivery team, how are they communicating? How are we making sure that knowledge is being transferred? How are we making sure that we're not re-onboarding the client and asking them the same questions in discovery that we did during sales and then yep. the delivery? So I think a lot of it is trying to, sounds, you know, maybe not the answer you wanted, like less delivery process and more client experience overall and just trying to not get caught up in, well, it has to work in this particular flow, in this state, for this team. I, I think it's very easy to over-engineer delivery um, and under-engineer what the client actually has to do in the process. And every project delay is related to clients, right? I mean, nine times out of 10 at least. They don't have their content, they don't have their stakeholders, they have last minute you know, change requests. Um, they're unhappy because expectations weren't properly set. So really trying to think through that and what, what impact they're going to have on delivery as opposed to what impact your team is gonna have on delivery. Because it's very seldom that your team drops the ball. I mean, yeah, people fuck up. But like, generally, it's, it's the expectations and the relationship between you and the client. So that's what we've been trying to think a little bit more about. And so you, you mentioned about not over-engineering delivery. And I think that's very, very uh, interesting to me because in the past, I have over-engineered delivery. Oh, I have over-engineered <laughs> <Right>? some shit. <laughs> and, and what that ends up happening is it, you burn your people and burn people don't deliver good results regardless. Yeah. Right, um, and so, what are? Some, can you give us an example of what an over-engineered, you know, delivery process might look like? Yeah. So I, I think when you're when you're designing any kind of process or any kind of system, um, it requires the more complex the system, right? Because you're trying to accommodate edge cases, you're trying to create more granular analysis, whatever it is, it's going to require more compliance. More compliance by your team and data input, more compliance in steps, more compliance in double checking. Um, sometimes that's necessary, right? I think especially as you move up upstream, uh, you will see um, particular organizations have actual risk and compliance departments and they have QA expectations. So it's not something that you can ignore, but you have to understand the cost associated with adding all these requirements into the things that you do. Um, and this is something that we've experienced internally. We've built a lot of business intelligence capabilities, um, which are great when they work, but things typically work or don't work because there's a flaw in your data entry process, right? Or there's a flaw in process adherence. And so really trying to figure out that balance between meeting the client requirements without putting yourself in a position where, holy shit, we have to do a thousand things just to make this thing work. And because these things are also gonna make you slow and expensive, yeah. right? And just 100%. because we're serving the enterprise doesn't mean that we get to be, well, we get to charge higher, but not within reason, right? Yeah. And so these things will slow you down and also make you more expensive. So there's, a, there's definitely a balance to be struck there. Yeah, definitely. Right, and so I wanna to touch upon the same point that I talked about with Lisa, and that is how do you find the balance of Again, you know, so you're, you're the ops guy, and I'm sure uh, Lisa's the biz dev guy, and, girl, sorry, <laughs> and, and, you know, in my experience, you're gonna butt in because you want flexibility because you wanna say yes, not all the time, but sometimes to a customer, and you're the guy saying, this is gonna destroy my process. And so, how do you, how do you find that balance? Yeah, some of the things that we've done, you know, again, thinking about that client experience and sort of where do the teams all interact is trying to bring the delivery team further up into the process. So get delivery integrated into sales. So a couple different things that we've done is one, actually introducing the client to the delivery team in the sales process. One, it helps to humanize you as an agency. Um, two, it helps to build earlier understandings. And three, deeper relationships with the client. So it's not worth it for every deal, but when you're talking enterprise, you're talking about half million, million dollar opportunities, yeah, absolutely. it's absolutely worth a two hour non billable meeting. You know? and I think they expect that too. They 100%. wanna see, they don't wanna just see the salesperson. Exactly. They wanna see their, your head of delivery, they wanna see your CTO, they wanna see maybe your leads, or maybe even if they're, they're doing the due diligence right, they don't even wanna talk to some of your like junior people and gauge what the quality of those people are. Definitely, definitely, right? yeah. So that's a big thing for us. The second thing is actually having our delivery uh, team manage sales engineering. So when a client comes to us and they're like, okay, we wanna do this thing, um, it, it's expected you're gonna have to give out some free hours, right? You gotta do some scoping before you can put together even a rough proposal. Uh, we actually try to have our director of delivery or one of our program managers uh, facilitating that process hand in hand with the sales engineer. That allows us to build deeper understanding, set 
better expectations, make sure there's deeper alignment in the sales process before we even ship a sow out to the client. So that's really helpful for us. Um, so I think those two things have kind of gone a long way uh, in, in building a tighter connection between the two. And lastly is just make sure people are talking. Make sure you're not isolating sales from delivery. Get the same people in the meetings like you were talking about with clients. You gotta do the same shit internally. You gotta make sure sales and delivery are talking constantly. Um, the last thing that we do that I think does help is from a resource planning perspective, we actually pull our sales pipeline data into that conversation. So we'll do an entire resource plan. We usually do it on a monthly basis. Um, so we'll plan out a whole month purely based on what's active work but then we'll also kind of scenario play, okay, here's, here's what's in the pipeline based on expected close, weighted by stage. What would that look like for us? Are we fucked? <laughs> do we need to ramp up? Are we cool? Do we need to slow play this? How do we kind of roll this, this potential uh, sales impact? And that gives our, our delivery team an opportunity to say, whoa, 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 we can't do that. That's not a thing. What is, why is this in the pipeline? So that, that's useful as well. Perfect. Um, I have another question, and this is for all of the panelists. Um, I've observed that some enterprise clients will even want to, now we, we work in an office, we're not remote. Um, well, at least most of us are in an office together in a single site. And so what I've observed is in a few instances that clients would want to fly down and spend a few hours with you in your office and all they're trying to see is how you operate. You know, they want to they peek behind the curtain. Right, it's, it's, it's one thing to put a, a good face on when you're on a Zoom call or something, but then they wanna fly down and see the real you. Is that something like you guys have experienced or, and how do you manage expectations? How do you handle those situations? I don't think they ever want, they wanna come to us, but I think it's, it's key to go to them. And I, I think a lot of questions that we get too are, who's actually gonna do the work? Because they see the face of sales and they're like, oh, who's gonna do the work? So when you can introduce them to your team, your tech ops people, um, and they actually see there's real people there, um, I think that's key. So going to them, I think, is proven advantageous for us. Absolutely. <clears throat> so we have, we have um, I think, seven, eight minutes for questions. Um, I think we can take um, two or three questions. I'll, I'll do the mic. Hey, my question's for Lisa. Um, I'm curious about the roles to whom you can say, uh-uh, that's not in the scope of work, and also whether or not you may occasionally say, could we trade this request for, what could we trade for this request? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. The roles to whom you feel comfortable saying, no, that's not in the scope of work. Okay. And then also, have you ever experimented with saying, okay, could we trade this request that's out of scope for something else? Yeah, I think when you can be real flexible with their budget. Um, so one of the things that we've talked about recently is managing to budget, not to scope, right? So if you say that your project is $100,000, let's manage to that 100,000, and I want the world, well, you can't get the world for that budget, but maybe you can have this very small portion of the world for that budget. So I think if you let the clients have the flexibility to say what's really important to them, that's, that's helpful. Versus this is the scope, this is all you get. You know, let them negotiate, let them figure out what works best for them and prioritize. Great, we can do two more questions. Um, sometimes the way that we approach that is, and actually clients have even given us this process, is to do like a level of effort assessment for, you know, like just rating. It's like not particularly always data driven, but like what's the level of effort to implement this and then how much impact will it have on the business and what resources it'll take. And they'll just sort of do an, a spreadsheet and we'll sort them. I think like helping them see where they can allocate resources, but our brands are much smaller, so I'm curious if there's a similar approach or something else in terms of our process that you guys have found is successful. Um, I, would, I would just say that uh, the commonality sounds like we're, we're now trying to make clients uh, manage their own 
you know, expectations in a way and, and budget. And I'd say certainly in the enterprise space uh, more so because they're, I think they're more understanding. They have, they, they, they've gone through it enough times usually, but smaller customers are going to push harder because they might have, you know, limited budget um, and want to get more from you. So, but I think, I think commonality is that if we can get them to understand what their expectations are, what, you know, what can we do within that time, they'll, along the way, letting them know and being transparent, they'll manage their own, uh, you know, expectations, so. All right, I hope that was helpful. I think we can take one last question. No questions? Oh, no, no, this is for anyone. Um, curious about any stories of, like, getting caught in the political crossfire, especially at the enterprise levels. Because, you know, with C-suite, you might be working on a project that might be encroaching on someone's territory or, you know, kind of undermining someone. Anything and how you might have navigated it, anybody? That is a great question. I would love the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, we've done a few like that. And it can go... All directions, I think. It could be uh, investments, board of directors at a client that make choices. could be in Europe, GDPR, that becomes an issue. Um, my learning is always that in the end, it will be okay. Uh, and, and find a way to cope with it. I, we try to not join the political game at the client, but I think we talked about it in the beginning. It's your key contact, set them up for success give them what they need uh, in order to succeed within the organization. Because if you give them what they need and they can then succeed, you gain their trust and for the project, you're, yeah, you're, it's a good departure. I just wanted to add, I think I've had a scenario where the, the key contact is the problem and you, you kind of, it's hard to navigate that because you, know, you can go to their boss and say, hey, like, do you know? that this person sucks at their job, um, but you have to like wait it out. And because uh, there's just so many people, you don't know who you can go to in that organization uh, typically and or you, who you could trust. It, it, it is tough for sure, um, but it's certainly happened to me. What I've found helpful, and this is after failing a couple of times, is very early on, I think you should have a very good account map of who's who in the organization. Um, because when you're, in the pre-sale process and about to close, these stakeholders will come to you and they'll have those conversations. So it's very helpful to understand very early on who's who in the organization. And then, you know, if these situations arise, then you'll have a lot of context to navigate around, around these situations. All right, I think we'll close with that. Thank you so much, folks, for listening. Um, I hope this was helpful.